webinar. We're so excited to have everyone here. Um, before I introduce our guest speaker, if you have any questions that you would want to ask through to our speaker or to us, we have a link to a Google form questionnaire that we will be asking along the way or near the end of the webinar. And this is all going to be kept anonymous, so feel free to share any questions you want without feeling pressured or embarrassed to ask. It. We're very welcoming here, and this is why we're here to do this webinar, to ask and answer questions like these. So today we are joined by Sharday Corjona. She is a uh, licensed therapist, youth and health family outreach specialist for the State of Michigan Stay Well program, and she has worked for over a decade uh, providing trauma-informed crisis interventions and mental health support to youth and families. During this, uh, during that period, she has also managed a program that provided harm-reduced based substance and treatment to adolescents and young adults. So I'm going to pass the floor over to her, and we will get started. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. I am really excited to be here with you all, and I'm just really appreciative that this is how we get to spend our time this afternoon. So again, thank you for being here and specifically being here for this conversation. Um, that was beautifully said. I think if there's any questions that come up, I just want you all to hear again from me. I know we have an anonymous way of kind of containerizing those and that we'll spend some time um, going over specific questions, both as they come up and as at the end. I know sometimes folks are often kind of hesitant to ask questions, and I want you all to know that's the most important part to me. So I came prepared with a lot of different kind of topics and just foundation for this conversation. Um, at any time, we can always stop that, pause that, and, and focus wherever we need to. Okay, so I'll kind of let you all take care of that and you just stop me, let me know where we need to pause. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and bring up the slides and I'll give a, another overview of both what the Stay Well program is and then kind of what we're going to talk about today. Okay. All right, I'm going to go ahead and it looks like I might need permission to share my screen. I think that's something you all have to change in here and perfect. Thank you. All righty. And I just like to confirm, can everybody see that? Okay. Yes, we can see that. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So again, um, my name is Shardy Corhonen. I'm a licensed therapist and outreach specialist with the Stay Well program. Um, if any of those other topics, um, they're kind of a part of my introduction, sound like they'd be helpful to elaborate on. I'd like to give some context. I'm happy to talk about that as well. Um, specifically around like harm reduction, there's going to be some pieces in here around um, substance use in the sense of when it might seem like we need a little bit more support or how to talk about that. But I didn't include a ton. So if we want to dig a little bit deeper, we can spend some time doing that too. Um, and then just again, um, the Stay Well program was really born out of the COVID-19 pandemic. And the intention was really to support folks throughout Michigan in navigating the impact of the pandemic, which really right now we're going to continue to have this conversation and talk about kind of our current experiences, but also what the aftermath of that looks like. So you'll hear a lot in reference to this program, COVID-19 specifically, and really Really what that just means is that we have all been impacted by the pandemic and we're still figuring out how it's impacted us and how we continue to navigate it together. So the other couple of pieces that are helpful to know about the Stay Well program is that first here, our first column is just kind of an overview of exactly what we're doing today. So our team goes out and talks to lots of different programs, um, just all across the state, any place that we're invited into. We also do some webinars that are available online and provide all kinds of resources, um, really based off of whatever we're hearing the needs are. We kind of work together to shape and advocate for those materials being available and free to everyone. So that second column is the other big takeaway 
from today. So we have a 24 hour counseling line that anybody can reach out to for support at any time. Again, you might see COVID-19 and feel like, mm, not sure if that's exactly the right line to call, right? It's okay. I mean, there is no wrong reason to call this line. And if for whatever the, the reason may be, you feel like you need a little bit of extra support or some other additional resources, they'll connect you to those. So never a wrong reason to call, but a good, good line to keep in mind if you need some extra support or someone to talk to. Okay, so this is a quick overview of what today is going to look like. So in just a second, we're going to talk a little bit about like mental wellness kind of through the lens of how do we know if things are kind of off, right? How do we know if we need a little bit of extra support? There's certain things that we should be paying attention to. Um, we'll then go into like, how do we support ourselves and how do we support others? And then lastly, we'll talk through some support and resources and then answer any like questions that you all have. Okay. So what I do want to share today is I know um, most of the folks that are going to be a part of this conversation today might be like young folks. We also might have some community members. I say all that to say you're going to hear me kind of switching my language a little bit. What I want you all to know is there's nothing that I'm going to talk about today that is going to be specific or not apply to any of these groups. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about it in a second. But what I want you all to hear is if you have little ones in your lives, right? If you are also the caretaker of some like little, little ones, um, or if you're a parent or guardian, or you're a teen who's supporting one of your friends or someone you care about, all of that's going to be kind of touched on throughout this presentation. And what we're going to talk about is maybe how some of those like behaviors or those symptoms might look a little different. So I wanted to say that up front in case it feels different as we go along. That's intentional. So first of all, again, this is one of those categories that kind of just apply to all of us, right? So our mental health may need some attention. So some extra focus, we might notice something's off if we're sleeping more than usual or we're not sleeping enough. So we're noticing some changing to our sleep, changes to our sleep habits. If we're having a tough time with others, so that can really mean maybe we're noticing that we're a little bit snappy, right? We're noticing that the way that we're having conversations or the energy that we usually have just feels different, right? We notice that in ourselves. We might be feeling angry or sad for long periods of time. So of course we know it's normal for our emotions to change, but if that's happening for a long period of time and we're feeling kind of stuck or like we can't get out of it, that's a good time to pay some extra close attention, right? If we're feeling alone, um, that one, a lot of times we connect with feeling hopeless, right? Or like nothing else matters. We kind of feel disconnected and like we're by ourselves, like other people don't understand. Um, we might start to shut down, right? That could kind of connect with the other two as well, where we just don't want to interact with anybody else. We just want a lot of time by ourselves. We're not able to show up and do the things that we need to do to take care of ourselves or maybe others, um, we start to use technology as a distraction. I mean, that's a good one because we got to think about now how often we have to use technology, right? And then trying to figure out for ourselves where that line is. So when is this something I have to do versus when am I using this to distract myself or to cope and not feel something that's uncomfortable or tough right now? I mean, so that line can be really hard to see and to feel, but that's a big one I think where we do, myself included, more and more often these days is we're using that technology when we're really experiencing something uncomfortable or really stressful. We're trying to change kind of our current state of, of being or how we're feeling. Um, avoiding people, places, or things. So just, again, not being able to show up the way that we need to. And then having a lack of interest, like kind of everything just becomes dull, right? We're kind of neutral, kind of tapped out again. So some other things that we might notice 
this is the one that I really wanted to kind of um, also frame for our like little littles. So this is more common with more so children under we'll say 10, but it can really also vary depending on developmentally where we're at. So for a host of factors, we all might do this at different times for different reasons, but you're going to see especially those stomach aches, maybe some of those rashes, those physical symptoms. When we have our little ones that aren't as verbal or able to articulate how they're feeling, they're going to want to maybe kind of attach a little bit more or be more nervous or afraid of being alone. It'll start to manifest in their nightmares, their dreams, um, having trouble using the bathroom appropriately, right? So lo last loss of bladder or bowel control, that is really, really common. That one in the stomach ache seems to happen pretty quickly um, if there's any sort of like emotional distress. And then here, again, this is kind of across the board. So these are kind of for more, um, more general, I want to say more common and applying to lots of different um, emotional states, I guess we could say. But when we're thinking about like having a headache, I think just to kind of step back for a second, what happens anytime that we're not feeling good emotionally is it's going to manifest in our bodies somehow. And usually one of those first signs is a headache. It can also, again, at any age, it can be a stomach ache. We might start to notice some kind of um, kind of like stomach churning or discomfort, um, dizziness. This one happens for myself a lot, or I'll get, get really warm, right? I'll start to overheat, notice my body temperature changing, and I might get a little dizzy. And oftentimes that could be from our blood pressure changing, the change in temperature, right? All of these kind of quick arousal symptoms that are happening. I mean, they're going to start to manifest in all these different ways. So muscle tightness, pain, and tension, that one's common too, where sometimes we can experience something for so long, we might start to think that it's, it's normal for our bodies, right? This is just how it is. But it could be a buildup of tension over time. Sleepy, that might be really common, but it also might be a sign that we're just not getting enough sleep or enough like genuine rest. So even when we are sleeping, we're not actually sleeping through the night or waking up frequently, right? We might be having some of those nightmares, um, numbness, tingling in our bodies. Again, we might feel disconnected, that hot, sweaty, or cold and chills. So that was kind of like extreme changes in our body temperature. So all these different manifestations, it all comes out differently for all of us. Um, but usually in some way, your body is going to tell you that something is going on, right? It's going to try and give you some sort of signal or some, si some kind of sign that something is off. And then the other thing here, kind of in that same category that I wanted us to talk about just a little bit, I want to add a little disclaimer. I'm using the language anxiety and panic attacks because they're often common, right? More common than we think. And sometimes some of those symptoms just get in kind of get written off when it could potentially be something a little bit more serious, especially if it's happening frequently. So we're, we have a little bit more information just kind of in society and our communities more so now around anxiety. I, I do hear us talking about that more. Panic attacks on the other end, those are those really intense emotions that can almost be really crippling. And what happens is we might feel like we're having a heart attack, like our heart might race. Um, again, our body temperature might change, but panic attacks can also feel like a sudden wave of emotion, right? I've seen panic attacks come out as like literally like just waterfalls of tears where maybe there's some shaking involved. There's this intense feeling of fear, right? All 
all of these different symptoms that come on so quickly can sometimes not even be connected to what's happening in that moment. And it can be really scary when we're feeling it or when we're experiencing that. So I want to talk about it and I want to say it out loud. And that might not be what you're experiencing, but also in that moment, if you are, I, I want you all to know that that's okay. And that oftentimes those feelings pass, but we have to breathe through them. So if you ever do have those like really intense waves of emotions, if you're starting to feel any physical pain, this is always, always, always a time that we want to call for some emergency attention, right? We want to call 911. We want to get checked out if you're having any of these symptoms. But again, also just to recognize that what we can do individually when we start to feel these things is we just want to jump to really, really breathing, right? We want to engage our breath and take some really full deep breaths and that will help us with any of the things that were that are here on the list okay and I know that can feel kind of like it's probably not that simple it's not it's not at all and it's going to take a minute but if we're feeling that really intense feeling like it's out of our control and it's overwhelming and I don't know how to handle this just remember always come back to your breath and just try and focus on your on some really deep breathing okay and we'll talk through some exercises at the end of this cuz we do have some tools I can share too um but we'll come back to this a little later i'm excited to hear if you all have any specific questions but again any of the items that are here on the list can apply to anxiety 100% right those symptoms of anxiety um but they can also if they're happening for those shortened bursts of time in more of that intense feeling that could also be signs of a panic attack too Okay, so just being mindful of that. And of course, again, that we always still want to talk to a medical professional after that moment has passed, right? If we can call 911, get someone there to support us, follow up with a doctor, and to make sure we're getting some support around all of these. Okay, and then on a more regular basis, I think when we're thinking about how we're interacting with others, it's also really important to notice that sometimes Again, right now, if we even take it back to the pandemic or anything that we all are kind of experiencing right now collectively, we're just noticing a lot more of those common symptoms of anxiety, that anxiousness, right? That unsettled feeling. So if someone is having those feelings or does have some sort of anxiety disorder, meaning it's just happening kind of all the time or frequently, here's some things to keep in mind, right? They might have a tough time returning a phone call, right? Or a text message. They might change plans at the last minute. They might have a tough time um, finishing a task, right? Or a project. They might be nervous to explore a new environment. And then they might need or want to plan things ahead. So I included this for a couple reasons. I think this is a good way for us to check in with ourselves and say, you know, do does any of these sound true for me? But also to have a lot of grace for those that we care about, because sometimes we might just feel like, like they don't want to spend time with us, right? Or that they're not able to show up for us. And that might be really hard to feel on our end. Or maybe it's someone who asks a lot of questions and wants a lot of details or might not go along with the plan unless they know what it is. So just again, some context to think about, like maybe we can talk through some of those plans together, right? Maybe I need to ask some of these questions to find out how they're feeling and what they're experiencing. So we can talk through this a little bit more too at the end. Um, I'm happy to come back to it, but again, just wanna kind of put some questions out there of a good place to start when we just might not know, right? These are some um, kind of ideas around what someone might also just be experiencing on their end. And then 
a friend might need help if I want to bring your attention to the emoji, right? The no, really, I'm okay. How many of us have heard that before? When we're like, you're not okay. Things are not okay right now, right? But they might, or we might really feel confident in the moment. Like, I got this. Everything's okay. So sometimes we'll hear, no, really, I'm okay. And, and we might really recognize that they need some extra support. So if they tell us that they're going to hurt themselves or someone else, that's an absolute um, 100% right time that they need some extra support. And I will tell you that when we're thinking clinically, I guess we could use that language, but um, anytime someone says that they're going to hurt themselves or someone else, that changes the legal confidentiality standards. And I want to emphasize that just to say how serious that is. So anytime you reach out for um, support and you're talking to like a therapist or a counselor, often a doctor, um, there will be some of that protections under confidentiality. What you share is private. But this is one of those circumstances where we always tell folks up front, this is a time that we will have to break that confidentiality. We will have to share. And when we talk to others about kind of what to keep in mind when we're talking to our friends or the people that we care about, we can let them know pretty directly, right? Like this is a time that I'm going to have to tell someone, right? This is a time that we're going to have to get some extra support because you should never have to handle that on your own. Um, so just really wanting to emphasize that you know, if someone ever tells you that they're going to hurt your, hurt themselves or someone else, we want to reach out for support and that's not breaking their trust or their privacy. It's that things are at a point where it's that serious, right? We need to get some help. Um, and if they stop coming to work or school or avoiding people, places, or things, that's just a sign, right? If that happens for a long period of time, quite a few days in a row, we want to make sure we're checking in. We want to make sure that they're doing okay. Um, if they're experiencing intense emotions that impact their relationships or ability to function. So again, we might have an an immediate reaction ourselves. So we might be upset or hurt by something that happened when in reality, they might also be acting from a place where they're just not okay, right? If they're not typically kind of upset or angry or really down, and we suddenly notice that that's a very different pattern, again, that's a time to kind of check in with them, talk to them about what's going on and try and get some extra support. And then if they're using drugs or alcohol to cope with their emotions. So that one I think is kind of straightforward, but that doesn't mean that if we see or we hear someone using drugs or alcohol that we immediately need to call for help. But again, these are on our list just to say, if you're noticing that someone is trying to cope with these tools, that we need to be talking about it, right? That's how we can be a good friend and how we can support them is at least acknowledging it and talking to them about what's going on and how they're feeling. Okay, so I'm okay to pause here or I can keep going, but we're at a point where we're going to kind of transition into net, the now, like, what can I do? How can I help? So if anyone has questions, feel free to ask them in the Google form that we sent. Um, so yeah, I also have a question. If someone is having like a panic attack or is having trouble communicating, with someone and you can feel that they're starting to get tense like what can you do to help them relax make sure like you, it's okay to talk to them and that yeah yeah it's a really great question we'll you'll see a list of a couple tools in a minute so I want you to know we'll talk about even more but I'm going to give you a couple right now so if that's happening right in the moment some really interesting things that can help is something like an ice cube if you have something cold nearby so what often happens is we're kind of flooded with those emotions in our minds and we want to get back into our bodies so anything that we can do that's kind of sensory 
if there's a scent that you can pull on oranges, like citrusy smells are really helpful. Um, but any sort of scents that are around, but definitely a temperature change. So maybe a heating pad or an ice cube, drinking a cold cup of water, right? Water is always our best case scenario, but anything um, that's safe at that moment, right? But something that's going to um, hopefully be cooling to the body. And then some of the other things, like I said, breathing, what I've really seen be really helpful is breathing with that person. So it can kind of feel odd in the moment because you'll notice that you might not see an immediate change and it might feel like, is this really helping? But on the other end, it does, right? So sometimes, again, when you're kind of in that heightened state, it's hard to get that message to connect. So if you can look at someone right across from you and you can do that literally breathing together and just model that, that can be really effective too. So I think we covered some scents, some sensory, um, some ice cubes, right? Some drink, get a drink of water. Um, and then also just coming back to our breath and doing some deep breathing together, modeling it for them. Try and give them some space too. It's okay if you stay close, um, but you'll also notice sometimes it can kind of feel like the, the room is kind of closing in, right? Like there's not a lot of air. So if you need to kind of recognize how much space that person needs, stay close, but give them some space. It's not a time where we really want to hug someone, right? And want to nurture even though that might feel like what you know the go-to make sure you're kind of picking up on those cues and giving them some air thank you yeah do we have any other questions come in i don't see any in the forum right now so okay. i think we'll be good to go Okay. But if anyone has them, I guess, last chance. Yep. And then we're moving on. And like I said, you can stop me at any time. So that's okay, too. And we also don't have to wait until the break to talk about anything. So I don't want you all to forget. If something comes up, like, feel free to throw it in there. I mean, we can talk through it right in the moment. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next slide. Um, so thinking about like, what can we do? I always like to start with thinking about empathy, right? So empathy is the ability to emotionally understand what other people may be feeling, see things from their point of view and imagine yourself in their place. Right. And I really want to emphasize the understand piece. We never say that we understand someone else's experience because we can't. We can never fully understand what someone else is experiencing or feeling. Um, but trying to imagine is really a better way of saying this. And I, I also included that may, right? We don't know. We're trying to get a sense. We're trying to check in with them and, and find out more information. Um, but the idea is trying to, right, attempting to, to consider how someone else might be feeling or experiencing things. So I want to go back to what we had talked about earlier and quite a few of those slides where oftentimes we have some sort of emotional reaction to whatever is happening. So if we have someone, right, a friend, a family member, um, someone that we care for who is in just a heightened state is what we call it. Like if someone is upset, if they are, um, even if they're kind of low, right? And not really responding to us in the way that they usually do. Um, but it could be upset or angry. All these different states that sometimes are also directed toward us. It can be really tough to be empathetic in that moment, right? It can be really tough to put ourselves in their shoes. And that's always where we want to start is just try and kind of take ourselves out of the equation just for a second and try and imagine how they're feeling, right? Trying to get a sense of where they're at. So that way we're not really reacting to our emotional needs in the second, but we're trying to support them and get a sense of how they're feeling. 
So again, this is really from the framework of what do we do? What's our first response? Okay. So oftentimes it can feel really tough and just, I want to use the language of stuck, right? Like I don't really know what to do or how to respond in this situation. So what I'm not saying to do is to ever put your emotions to the side or not consider how you're feeling. This is what is the very next thing that I do or say, how do I handle this, this situation, right? So some of the things that you could say when we're thinking about responding with empathy is just acknowledging it right? So saying something like, it seems like you had a really hard day today, right? That sounds really stressful. That must have been really tough for you. That wasn't how you seen your day going. Okay. So these aren't necessarily in response to anything in particular, um, but just to kind of give us an idea of what is an empathy statement, like what does it mean to express empathy? Most of these could fall into a whole different host of categories, right? But the idea is to just acknowledge that that person is in a tough space and to come alongside them and to really try and get a sense of, you know, where they're at, right? Empathize with what they're experiencing. And then the next thing that we can do, so now I'm going to bring it back to this is any situation. This is if it's us. This is if we're supporting someone else. Um, I felt like there was another scenario. I apologize. I wanted to list if it's us or if we're supporting someone else, um, but some tools that we can use at any time. So first of all, we want to listen, right? That's kind of a go or a given. Um, if we're in the moment and we're having a conversation and we're noticing that someone's having a tough time, we also want someone to listen to us. So that can also be finding support and reaching out if we need to talk and we need to kind of express how we're feeling too. But things like mindfulness videos or meditation apps, there's a ton that you can pull up on your phone. Um, there's a couple of them on TV now too. There's a couple other ones on our website that I can also share with you in a little bit. The five senses activity. This is the other example I wanted to list when we're thinking about anxiety or panic attacks. And this five senses um kind of tool. It doesn't have to be these numbers specifically. So I will tell you, unless I'm looking at it, I don't remember what these are. <laughs> so on our magnet, we have a, a, a magnet that I can get you all to if you don't have them yet. We have stickers and magnets, um, some posters, but this one in particular, it's on the magnet. So if you would like this, it's on a hand that you trace and it lists off like identifying five things you can see, four things you can hear, three things you can feel, two that you can smell, one thing that you can taste. And again, it's to kind of bring us out of all of those emotions and back into our bodies and kind of aware of our surroundings. So it's called a grounding technique because it's kind of grounding us in the moment and where we're at. Um, getting a cold drink of water, we talked about that one. Uh, writing, drawing, anything that we can do to get those emotions out creatively. It's not limited to drawing or just writing things out, but any way that you feel you would want to express yourself, right? Something that you're doing actively, physical activity. So stretching, dancing, taking a walk, anytime that we're moving our body, grabbing a fidget or a stress ball, listening to music. Don't underestimate music. But what I will say is, while any kind of music is always going to be helpful, sometimes we go toward music that mirrors how we're feeling, and that doesn't always help us feel better. It helps us feel validated, right? Like real valid in our feelings. <laughs> it co-signs our feelings. But sometimes music can also be a tool to help us kind of change our energy. So if we're having a really tough time, maybe picking some lyrics that are a little bit more positive or hopeful hopeful or something that's instrumental, but has kind of a slower beat. If we're feeling like anxious or heightened, we can kind of lower that energy by kind of offering ourselves some calmer music, some calmer 
beats or instruments. Um, and then on the opposite end too, like if we're feeling like we're having a low day or having trouble getting motivated or energized, putting on something that has a little bit more of like a, you know, um, energized beat to it, right? Some fun music that really brings you joy. So you can spend time doing those things ahead of time too. I actually just did this the other day and where <laughs> I started to pull things into a playlist, right? So in those moments that you're not in the moment, you figure out what those go-tos are for you, like what those songs are, what you want to pull from when you really need them, can be a really powerful tool to keep on hand. And then also you could share that with a friend, right? You could share that with someone you care about. You could send that to them if they're having a tough time. That could also be kind of a low, low key and low barrier way of like communicating. So just something a little fun, different. We could also make a playlist together, right? And I was gonna say playing a game together. So that's another really good tool. Again, just things that are gonna get us out of the moment. You know, so playing a video game, um, it could be playing a card game, but thinking about things that are just genuine to your relationship that you really enjoy doing. You want it to be fun. Um, it could be tic-tac-toe, right? It could be something just really simple, but it could be as kind of involved as just playing a video game, um, something that's kind of going to take you away for a minute. And then the other one here, I want to make sure we talked about this today. So if someone says that they're going to end their life, right? So I always like to talk pretty openly and direct about suicide. Um, for young people, just in general, the rate of suicide has increased drastically over these past couple years. And I think it's really important that we all have the tools to at least feel I think comfortable is not the right word, but I hope maybe a version of confident um, in asking. And again, this is one of those things where we might have to practice, which might feel a little weird, but we might have to practice ahead of time. Like, how might I say that if I needed to ask my friend if they were going to end their life? Right. So asking them first, if someone does come to you and shares this with you, you, you want to ask if they have a plan, right? This is the, how do you handle it? What do you do? Ask them very directly if they have a plan, how would you do it? You know, what have you been thinking? You want to figure out if they have the means to do it. So then the next is if they do have those means, you want to try and remove any of those harmful items or try and remove them from the space where the harmful items are. Um, never, ever jeopardize your own safety to do this. So making sure that it's safe to do so. Um, you might have to call for support or help first. Um, but that's kind of what we want to be mindful of is if it's safe to do so, we want to either remove them from the space where those items are, or we want to remove those items from where they have access to them. And then the next is stay with them, right? So you don't want to leave them alone in that moment, or you want to find somebody else who can stay there with them. And then you want to tell someone that you trust. It says an adult on here, right? Depending on who this is and who we're talking to, the most important part is that you're finding someone that is a supportive person, right? A safe and supportive person. So you're not handling this alone. Um, and then the next is that hopefully you're calling 911 together or a suicide hotline. Um, of course, if there's any sort of emergent danger, something going on in the moment, please call 911 first. But if you do need some extra support, just navigating the situation. So talk talking about it, figuring out what to do. Maybe you need someone to talk to them or to talk you through it. They can do that on that suicide hotline and they'll kind of talk you through every, every step of the way. Um, so I think I added the number on here, which is that 988. We can share out some more res resources later too. Um, but there used to be a very long number to call the suicide lifeline. Suicide prevention lifeline is the more formal name. Um, that number has now been connected to 988. So that's all you have to remember is just dial 988 and you'll get connected to someone who can support 988 
also now connects to all sorts of mental health resources too. So in addition to that stay well line, that's just another good number to know. You can always reach out and get mental health support by dialing that 988 number. Okay, and we're right at the end where I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about some of our programming and our resources. Um, so I'm happy to kind of jump into these and then we can come back together and talk through any other questions or specific topics, if that feels okay. Okay. Um, so these are some of the programs that we have going on right now. So the creative coping, I wanted to include this one, but it is for littles. So this is if you are a parent or a guardian or just caring for maybe an older sibling, like a family member, right, of someone who's on the littler end of things. That one is um, more art creative workshops. It's usually drawing and writing, um, but it's a space to kind of figure out how to express those emotions through art. The Wellness Workshop for Teens and Young Adults Experiencing Anxiety, that's a program that I run that's happening every Monday at 7.15, and that's on Zoom. Um, we're on our last session this Monday, and then the whole series starts again. And it's a series of four um, different topics each Monday. And then we just keep on starting that cycle over again. So the Staying Well, the Emotional Health Workshop for Teens, um, that one is kind of very similar, where as it also talks about kind of how to manage emotions, identifying different emotions, how to cope using different coping strategies. Um, that one is typically younger teens, whereas the first one on Mondays is kind of older teens, young adults, um, but very similar topics and they're open on both ends, but that's typically kind of how it goes. The coping with grief and loss for teens and young adults, that's just another good one to know about. It doesn't have to be a recent loss. We're not defining grief or loss in any specific way. If you feel like that's true for you, like please come, please check it out. Please share this if you know feels like it would be helpful to someone you know. Um, but it is a space to come and connect with other folks around the same age. It's kind of led by a licensed counselor and kind of going through all the different stages of grief and what that process and experience can be like and some tools for navigating it too. Um, so I can't emphasize that enough. I know we have a lot of loss lately just across the board related to COVID and so many other just different factors. I hear it right and left, and I, I hope that this space feels comfortable. But if you're also noticing that it's a, a space that you need and say this time doesn't work for you, um, just let me know. Let's keep on talking about it. Um, I want to make sure that that space in particular and that support is, is available. And I know we're only offering it once a week, but again, I'm hearing that would be really beneficial and we want to make sure that's at a time that works for everyone. And then we also have weekly discussion groups. So these are peer spaces. Um, we kind of avoid using the language support group, but I think that's more common language that it is a support group style space. Like your folks are typically coming to the group to get um, support from others who have a shared experience. And you just kind of get to talk to one another. It's led by a trained counselor, um, but it really is just more of an open space to connect with others, to kind of identify, you know, process your emotions, um, get some support and, um, and connect with others. And we also have a group that's, again, that one, the support for people who are grieving, that's similar to the grief and loss, where she does actually go through each week um, and focus on that specific topic. So that's open to everyone. If that time works better for you, you're welcome to attend that group too. And then Cultivating Joy, I wanted to highlight this series. It's on our website. It's really kind of, I think it's really fun. Um, all the different topics are illustrated. So they're illustrated videos that are kind of voiceovers that talk through all the different topics up here. So positive psychology, um, validating it's okay to not be okay. 
um, joyful activities. How do we heal? There's one on boundaries and that last one on gratitude and joy. And they're just really full of just so many different tools and resources and just lots of good energy. So a really good resource to just kind of pull out, play in the background. It can be one of our tools in our toolbox if we needed it on one of those rough days. But I wanted to kind of bring your attention to it and just remind you all that it's there. It's available on the website. You can check it out at any time. And they're also on YouTube. So you could like send it to yourself or save the link too. And then here are some of the other resources that I mentioned earlier. So here on the right side of the screen are the stickers and the magnets. That top one is the magnet that has the hand on it with that grounding exercise. And then that one right below it is a sticker that has um, square breathing. So it's just a reminder of a way to practice breathing in this specific tool, um, which is breathing in for four, holding for four, exhale for four, and then you pause and you do it again. Um, so that's just one kind of strategy that we like to share with everyone. I think there's also lots of other ways you'll hear like four, seven, eight breathing. They're all just different counts, but the idea is really in that bringing our attention to the count itself. Right. And that's kind of helping us as we're breathing to bring our attention to something else. And that helps us refocus. So these are some really good tools to use, good tools to have on hand. The QR codes take you back to the website. Um, there is some posters that we have that have different stretching um, poses on there. There's, again, that square breathing in a poster and then the... Um, well, in both of them, <laughs> yeah, then the same on the other poster. And then the tap series. So that is a host of mindfulness works or mindfulness videos, like guided meditations that are also available on the website. So a couple tools to pull from. And if you all don't have these, these are also things that we can send you for free in the mail too. So just let me know and I can make sure that you have some of these on hand. If you'd like them. And I think that was the last of things on my end. And then again, I'm happy to kind of close us out and stop sharing. Um, but I can also go back to any of the slides if there's anything that we want to spend some more time talking through. So I'd love to hear what questions you all have or just any takeaways if you don't have any questions, like what stood out. Alrighty, thank you so much. Um, feel free to use the Google form as well, or if you feel comfortable saying it out loud, we are open for any discussion. So feel free to use this as like a safe space to get anything out. Um, I'll I can start off. I have a question about like going back to like if someone's feeling troubled and you think they might um try to hurt themselves in any sort of way. What are so instead of like people might be like scared to admit that like I might take my life. How mm -hmm. can you notice warning signs beforehand and make sure that they can get the help they need before anything gets too serious? Yeah, absolutely. So some of the most common warning signs you'll often notice can be like withdrawing from social spaces, right? Can also be starting to give items away. You might start to hear things really directly, like them saying things like, I just want to like, I, I don't want to be here anymore. I'm just over this. Some folks will say like, I just want to die. I just, I'm done, right? These kind of like definite ending type language. Um, I always encourage folks to be mindful of that language because sometimes we'll hear things like, like, I just can't do this anymore. And we might not fully understand what's being said or meant by that, right? So I do think language like that is helpful for us to tune into and again, recognize it as one of those signs of, I need to get more information because it might just be, I'm having a rough day and it could also mean something a little bit more serious. So really tuning in and really paying attention to like, know your people, know your friends 
and, and make sure that if you're hearing some of those things that we're listening a little differently and we're listening with some intention. Um, I think those are the things that are really kind of top of the list. Um, trying to think of some other things that you might start to notice. So withdrawal, giving things away, definitely drastic changes in mood. Um, again, if you're not hearing from folks for a while, like check in on them. Um, so I make sure there isn't anything I'm missing. I talked to a group about this recently and <laughs> I really want to also kind of encourage us to to think about how technology is playing a role in in how we think about mental health and support in like our relationships. And again, think about how that's changed in these past couple of years. Um, because there is a list, you'll find lists of things to look for, common symptoms. But I think because we've collectively and many of us more so than others, right? have been in like some really tough spaces for so long. I think we're not always giving that same type of attention to allow those behaviors that we would have before. And it might've been easy to say that if someone was just, you know, feeling really low or had a really kind of depressed mood, a low mood, um, that maybe that that was a sign. And I think we just need to remember that because that's happening for longer periods of time right now, that we're talking about things more openly. That's what I want to encourage, that we're not assuming anything based on just what we're reading on a list or just what we're hearing to be those signs. Like pay attention to patterns, pay attention to, you know, just kind of overall how folks are really doing and, and some of, you know, what might seem kind of unusual for them. And again, I say all that to say, we might not be seeing people like we were. So what does that look like when it comes to text messages? Can you really that I'm good or I'm okay in a text message? Does that really mean the same as if we were seeing them face to face? So it's not always about kind of what we're hearing um, or what we're seeing, but also like paying attention to what we're reading and what we're hearing. So what I might say in text might be different. Right. So I don't want to <laughs> I can ramble for days, <laughs> but, but right like that, I think if nothing else, that's kind of what I want to leave you all with is, is try and figure out for like the folks that you really care about, what does that look like for them? And what are some of those things that you need to consider when we're thinking about like changes and how they're feeling in those patterns. But on the other end, it's more of those direct kind of signs where you might start to notice or hear some of that language of, of wanting things to be done, wanting to end my life, maybe giving things away, disconnecting and isolating themselves. Those are the common signs to look for, but please look a little bit deeper too. Thank you. Um, do you think with COVID-19 and everything that we see a trend in this form of like mental problems where it's like with depression and anxiety that those are escalating because we've been isolated for a while absolutely yeah, that's spot on that's spot on um and I think it doesn't always make it any easier for it to be validated but I think it is important to know that you're not alone that none of us are alone in navigating this and that it is really real like we're still trying to figure out how to do it um so in all these different spaces yes a hundred and 10% folks are really navigating things with, I think, a heightened sense of anxiety. Yeah. Um, and like I said before, too, like we are seeing folks really struggling with how to cope and manage things, just life, right, in all these different spaces. And that has shown an increase in folks who have ended their lives, right, who have. Yeah. Um, and since with the pandemic, it's, it's, it's hit everyone. It's been like this whole worldwide thing. Do you think it could have led to more of a normalization of mental health? So it's being harder to um, identify if I'm like really struggling. Is it normal to feel this way? Do I need to get help? Like how can someone identify that with themselves? Like is it 
Like, do you think it's just gotten to a point where, like, oh, I've been feeling sad for a while. It's fine because everyone has been this way. Me, I hear you 100%. I, I think it's yes. And I think, I think that it's been normalized for many of us in the sense that those emotions may be lasting for much, much longer periods of time. That does not mean that it's any less important, valid, severe, right? Just because it's been more frequent or has been happening for a longer period of time. So anytime that you're noticing any of those feelings, any of those symptoms, behaviors, whatever that might look like, that's still a time to reach out for some support. And on the other end of that, what has been, let's say helpful during and as a result of the pandemic, that has been like this push for us to have this conversation and for there to be more resources available. There's also been a more normalization of seeking mental health support, of accessing mental health services, of talking about suicide and of mental health. So I think, and I hope that that also feels validating that it doesn't all, I'm always going to encourage therapy and reaching out for some professional support, but I also hope that it, it becomes a conversation that, like I've said throughout today, you're talking about openly with your friends, your family, your communities, and you're, it's just a normal conversation to say, I mean, some of our coping strategies are we just need to spend time together, right? We've been isolated for so long. How can we spend more time together? Um, you know, how can we build in some of these, like moving our bodies? Maybe it's collectively going for walks. Maybe it's building in yoga or stretching or something into the things you're already doing. So if you're noticing these things, it's also an invitation to build in tools and routines that also can help. And it doesn't have to be separate. So even though it might feel normal, we can also build in normal daily responses to how we're feeling does that make sense yes that makes sense okay all right um those are pretty much my discussion topics if anyone has any feel free to chime in um we have a few other anonymous questions that have come in so if any of the other members want to chime in and read some of those make if you want to take over for a bit yeah. Um, wait. Okay. Yeah. My mic's on. Sorry. Um, yeah. So we have some questions from the Google form. Um, one of those was, how can we help our friends with mental illness? I know we kind of like talked about this a bit, but I guess if you could expand on that. Yeah. I think I'm hearing this as if we know that that's the case, right? So if there's been some sort of diagnosis, maybe we're not wondering, they're not necessarily needing to um, like reach out for support or get support. This is something that now we have this information. What do we do with it? How do I support them now? Is that fair to say? Let me know if anybody wants to kind of clarify in that um, anonymous form, you're welcome to, but that's kind of how I'm going to speak to it because what I'm hearing is they have some supports and you want to also provide additional support. What I will say in this, I think on this topic is I want us to think about boundaries, right? And that might be an interesting way to approach this conversation, but I mean, support is always going to be your friendship or relationship. There shouldn't be a ton of changes in your relationship, right? In your personal needs within that friendship. So if that is happening and they do have additional support, I mean, being clear about kind of what you're able to give, what support you're able to provide and kind of where your limit is, right? Like, are there times when maybe, I mean, again, I'll need a little bit more clarity around kind of what the specific example is, but if someone does have a mental illness that presents as anxiety or depression, right? So maybe that looks like avoidance, 
right? So maybe they're not ever returning your phone calls and maybe every time you reach out to them, you're not getting an answer and you really want to go do stuff, but they're not able to, again, I'm, this is a very specific scenario. So I'm happy to talk through others. Um, but think about what your needs are still as an individual and the way that you can support your friend is, you know, talking about that together. And maybe there are opportunities if they're having a tough time, maybe going places for you to be able to go and spend time with them. Um, right. Like really figuring out in that situation, what is doable and manageable and what they need, but then also being mindful of what you need and making sure that you are pulling in the supports that, that are going to be helpful to you too. Um, so that might mean that maybe you're also reaching out to other friends or you're spending time with other friends or family, um, but making sure that those boundaries, that that relationship and those um, kind of interactions, that friendship isn't causing you harm either. That's okay to say, right? It's okay to put up a boundary. It's okay to set a limit. And I think that gets really hard when we're thinking about mental health or mental illness and some of those more severe symptoms where there's a lot of love, there's a lot of care, and there should also be a limit on kind of what you're accepting too. That's okay. It's okay. That doesn't mean that you care any less, that you love them any less. It's okay to still protect yourself in that too, especially if they're getting support in other ways. And I think the other piece I can add to that too is that should never be your sole responsibility. Okay. So I think sometimes there's that other piece of feeling like if someone isn't getting support that you have to get them to that place to where they can kind of see that for themselves. And I think being mindful of that too. And that's what we talked about before. It's okay to kind of bring in some support. Don't feel like you have to handle or manage everything on your own because it can be really, really hard, right? Really tough to navigate, really heavy. Are there any other specific scenarios that we want to discuss or any other clarity that would be helpful? I mean, I don't know if I really answered that. I don't know if that was really helpful, but I think when we think about mental illness, I mean, there's so many different ways that that could manifest. So I think the biggest piece is talk about it, right? Talk about it with that person. Talk about what they need and don't be afraid to communicate what you need from that friendship or that relationship too. Thank you. Um, the next question in here is what is the best way a parent can help their child? Which I'm assuming is like, if you the parent can see that their child is struggling, what's like a way you can approach them? And what's the best help that a parent can get for them? Yeah, is open communication. Yeah, I'm always gonna come back to communication, right? Like that non-judgmental, that empathetic, which is again, I gave some examples starting there because everything else is going to be different from person to person. Whatever happens next is going to be based on a lot of different factors, but we got to start with being able to develop like trust and open communication and just to make sure that that there's an availability, right? That you're available, that you're responsive to those needs that come up. I hear that a lot where, again, I think this speaks to that idea of like these kind of experiences being normalized. Like we feel like this so often that it doesn't always get the same attention as it may have a while ago. So I think as a parent, as a guardian, as a caretaker, or even as a friend, like paying attention in observing some of those behaviors. So notice when things are off, notice when things are different and invite the, the conversation, like put it on the table is often how we'll say it. It's like, put it out there, right? Like notice what's happening um, and make sure that you're creating space to talk about it. And then on the other end of that, like just 
just be available for the conversation. And then from there, it's it can be hard, right? It can be hard to figure out what do I do with this information? You know, how do I navigate this? That's when we really encourage, like, feel free to reach out to those supports, to the counseling line, reach out to, you know, mental health professionals, um, medical professionals, whoever you feel like you need to, depending on the scenario. But the other tool I would offer is those things on the list, right, that we talked about earlier, like those coping strategies. So spending time together, playing games, you know, going for walks, like building in activities where you're, you're not, I don't know how to say this. It just, it doesn't have to always be completely separate. Like we can still build in kind of our response, like those tools into what we're doing. So, you know, using some of those tools and those strategies as a, as a, not really a solution, right. But as a reaction, as a tool um, to kind of navigate things in the moment too, Next question here. Um, this might come across. Uh, how, how do you interact with people who have mental illnesses? Are there topics to avoid or da da da? I'm just pausing. So again, I think we're we're using a very broad blanket. <laughs> For mental yeah. illness. And that's okay. I think I understand the intention of the question. Um, but I want to, I want to make sure my response isn't a blanket response either, because it would, it's going to change from situation to situation. Um, we always want to avoid blaming, right? Any sort of blaming, um, hyper-focusing on specific topics, um, it helps I guess we could kind of word it as like if someone's opening up to you about like their struggles mm -hmm. what are some ways you can make them feel validated instead of like you said blaming putting blame mm -hmm. on around yeah I think when it comes to validating their experience just appreciating that they shared it with you Right? So validating is literally just acknowledging the fact that it was shared, showing appreciation, using some of that empathy, um, talking through and, and really naming some of how they're experiencing the situation. So kind of exploring what that feels like for them, what those experiences are like. So asking some questions. And I think that's why I kind of started with the not blaming is not assuming that we fully understand again. And then also just not blaming for some of those behaviors or becoming too hyper-focused on any one area, because there's a good chance that maybe they also just don't have a full picture of what that experience is like for you on the other end either. So creating space for that to talk about it, um, appreciating that they're sharing it with you, validating how they're feeling, um, normalizing. We don't want to do a ton of normalizing, but it can be really helpful to normalize that. Oftentimes, maybe like a lot of folks have had similar experiences and have, right? So maybe that's part of an invitation. Um, but we also just don't want to minimize it because it probably feels to them in that moment um, really lonely, right? Like that they're the only one feeling like that. So normalizing, but also not kind of assuming that we fully understand what they're experiencing. Okay. Um, sorry. Uh, one of the next questions was how do you get diagnosed with a mental illness? Mm -hmm. 
You know, there's quite a few different ways to get diagnosed, but it's often by some sort of medical, mental health, prof medical and or mental health professional. So it can be like a clinician specifically, but it can also be a medical doctor that can um, formulate a diagnosis. But it's often based on a lot of different factors that have happened over time. And some of those things will come with like assessments or screenings. Um, thinking about like the GAD, the generalized anxiety assessment, that's something that they'll often do at a doctor's office, right? You might kind of have a diagnosis of anxiety directly given from a doctor, whereas maybe social anxiety might be something that might be prescribed as a therapist based on something that was shared over a period of time and happens in specific environments, right? So it's a very thorough answer, but the reality is reaching out to a mental health doctor or a, a healthcare professional, right? So medical um, or a mental health clinician specifically, it can also happen in school. So oftentimes, especially for our little ones, um, pretty early on, there's all these different assessments and markers like benchmarks and indicators for development. And if there are certain changes that teachers are seeing, that social workers are seeing, that other folks are seeing, and you know, there's some maybe documented interventions or support that's happened, that can also lead to what may later become a diagnosis. And I just want to say that out loud too, to mention that oftentimes there's a lot of supports involved, um, just kind of from like K through 12, right? As we're, as we're going through school, as we're growing up on that younger end where there's a lot of different like observation and feedback and teachers and social workers and counselors and a lot of different conversations that are happening. So that can be really valuable and helpful. And if we are getting to interact with those folks, like having those conversations too, um, and directly asking those types of questions can, can kind of be helpful if you're having some concerns and wondering like, am I only noticing this or what is this like at school? Because sometimes we do have a very specific uh, experience or like we only kind of get to see one time a day, right? Or one setting, and that might change for, for all of us. So lots of different ways to get to a diagnosis, but I'd also kind of want to elaborate on the fact that sometimes we don't have to also have a diagnosis to be able to recognize some of these behaviors and symptoms and start to kind of support ourselves with them or get support in other ways you don't have to have a diagnosis first in order to do those things. Adding on to like the diagnosis part, I heard like elsewhere about like self-diagnosing as well, which I believe that that last part is kind of what we were getting into. Like what are best ways to self-diagnose? I know there are tests online where it can be like from many mental health organization websites where it's like, if you feel like you have depression or anxiety or bipolar borderline personality disorder and there are tests online like are do you think those are like proper ways or if they're like some you want to avoid and taking like self-diagnosis tests no I don't often give a lot of guidance on these um and I want to be really intentional about this response because I don't ever want to prevent you or discourage accessing tools that are going to be beneficial. And there's so much out there yet that we just haven't caught up to. Um, you're going to have access on all of us collectively, have access on um, social media, on different platforms, on the internet to so much more information. So use that information. Let's not use the language diagnose. I think that's what we can we can kind of settle on is diagnose is such a formality that in full transparency, diagnose sometimes still doesn't even paint the full picture for what someone is experiencing. So diagnosed is a very medical specific term. And I say that in that way to say oftentimes um, when it comes to therapy and so we could kind of 
containerize it as therapy, but in a couple different settings, there has to be some sort of diagnosis for a certain level of treatment or for insurance to cover things specifically. Traditionally in our healthcare system, that's the way it's operated and why there's been such a encouraging kind of conversation around the diagnosis that then helps lead to access to treatment in a lot of ways. When we're talking about assessment tools, when we're talking about screening tools, screenings are really what I'm hearing in this, where it's how do I identify the specific symptoms or behaviors that I'm experiencing to better understand what this might be, to better understand how to talk talk about this. Those are really great tools that are online, but there might also be some misinformation. So leave room for that too. Everything that you're going to find online might not be accurate. So I think, you know, use the tools, use the resources that you have. And my hope is that that then leads to a broader conversation um, and that it doesn't end there. But I do think looking online and and getting that information is a good place to start. Um, And there's a lot of different tools. And also I'll use this as a quick commercial for our groups, right? The workshops that we have coming up, those are good spaces to check in with and continue to talk about those things. If you do have certain concerns about what's happening or certain um, like just feelings that you're feeling or certain behaviors, um, that can be a really good resource and a really good tool. Uh, if there's other specific ones, I'm happy to support after this. I know my email is still on the screen. So you're welcome to send that to me if you have. I mean, there's a ton of evidence-based tools that we really can use that are evidence-based, right? They're backed, they're clinical, um, they're free and they're available, different screenings. So I want to make sure you all have what you need if you, if you're looking for something specific, but let me know if there's any more clarity I can give on that, but I really appreciate the question. Thank you for that. Yes, that covers what I was asking. Okay. <laughs> So sorry. Um, our next question was: Is depressed depression always being sad? I think mm-hmm. what they're trying to ask is kind of like, what does it look like? Yeah, I mean, depression is not always being sad. So the f- depression is often kind of categorized by very specific like symptoms or behaviors, and again, it's often more so relevant to like the period of time, the fact that it's not a temporary mood or experience is that it doesn't change. So we're kind of feeling stuck in it. That's when we start to get into like disorders and diagnoses is when there's also um, just something happened for a prolonged period of time. But depression can look like irritability, right? Depression can be um, combined with anxiety. Different forms of depression can look Look like very low energy, very low mood. Um, but then there's also types of depression that are combined with that kind of manic state, right? That hyper arousal. So that lots of energy for a shortened or an uh, extended period of time, it all just really varies from from person to person, like situation to situation. But depression is also another Another diagnosis, another um, term that I think we've used more frequently and I think assumed a very specific presentation, right? We, We have a very specific image in our minds when we think of depression and you're very right, that can vary across the board. Um, I think what we always want to come back to is what those symptoms are and and hold them by themselves too. So if depression or your concerns around depression um, might look like that low energy or low motivation, then really thinking through kind of strategies to support that low motivation, right? So ways to kind of increase serotonin or dopamine in the brain. That's one of the things that often happens with like a medication treatment for, um, for depressive symptoms, but can also be 
activated or like supported by things like exercising, can be supported by certain foods that we're eating, right? Eating with some very intention or with a lot of intention for a certain period of time, um, just with that specific goal in mind. There's lots of different things that can be done. I mean, so kind of branched off our last question. That's a good way of thinking about it too. And instead of trying to get to the diagnosis right away, figuring out like, what am I feeling? And trying to figure out some strategies to target that specific experience. That's one of the, the first kind of tools that we can use to support our mental health is how do we get to, to that place where we want to be, right? How do we change our state and how we're feeling? And, and like, with, that's sorry. Okay. That's okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, well, I was just going to say with, like, with depression, the question being like, is depression always about being sad? Like you're saying, like, it's normally defined as like periods of Mm -hmm. feeling like hopelessness almost mm -hmm. is one way to define it even though someone like may be have feeling like happy during like during the school day and they come back home and they're cheery that doesn't mean like the depression has gone away in no. a sense right it no. could also be like going back to like masking as well mm -hmm. where like one person is like trying to show that they're happy to say like hey I'm not trying to like feel depressed could that be a way of like escapism or one what is a way that we could also like notice someone's masking and is that a sign that like they might need help or is it just normal or something you see often it definitely something we see often and I, I don't want to say normal common yes in common in different social settings common in different spaces common based on different relationships um I mean it can be a form of escapism for sure I think what I often kind of like to speak to is like the energy piece which I know is a little bit kind of ambiguous it's not always very clear but oftentimes like the personal experience that we're having I think the language I used a second ago was like that low energy like even though we might present as happy the feeling inside that we might personally identify with is is that kind of disconnect from it where this isn't a real feeling for me and that's the masking piece right I might have just enough energy to put on this front or to show or express this in a certain way but my internal feeling is actually very different and that's what's often kind of low low energy energy. I mean, that's the language that most often identify or is identified with depression, even though on the outside, we might be presenting differently. The feeling is often very low and kind of hard to get to that place where we're feeling or experiencing um, the emotions that we're presenting, right? That we're kind of facing outward with. Yes, thank you. And then I guess our last question that we have here written down is how does the school su system implement mental health to students and staff? Do you have any suggestions to improve mental health in schools? Every school does something a little different. Um, so I actually also work at, as a part of a program that does implement mental health programming in schools. So I work in a program that um, administers like social emotional learning, cognitive behavioral therapy and mindfulness and suicide prevention in schools. So a lot of schools do have this program connected to it and have implemented it kind of into their system. Like it's training, it's a curriculum that happens, um, there's tools, there's exercises, there's training that happens for staff, um, and then the students kind of go through the curriculum with the teachers, um, some with the mental health professionals, so with school social workers. I, of course, I'm excited that I get to see that in action. I'm grateful for it, and I would always encourage it, um, but it can look a lot of different ways. I, I have a tough time kind of answering this question because <laughs> I think what I would like you all to hear, there are ways that you can advocate for mental health supports in, in 
different resources in schools. Um, and I want you all to know that these curriculums exist and that they're available to districts and to classrooms and that there are social emotional learning resources um, just available and that this is happening. So I think in the districts that it's not, we can you know, work toward that. And I think outside of that too, I mean, doing initiatives, right? May is Mental Health Month. So kind of formulating different activities and groups and weeks and events and um, really taking the lead on starting those conversations and creating that space and maybe some signage or with different um, groups that might exist in your school, right? Talking about are there ideas that you all have for some sort of event or taking this on? Um, there are some programs that exist that will come in to the schools and kind of provide some extra tools and resources um, in support on. Um, I'll send it to you afterwards in case you want to send it out. I'm always so nervous about sharing specific programs out formally, but I want you all to have the resources so I can send you the links to look into. Um, but there's just some really, really cool stuff happening in the schools right now that I, mean, I always remind everyone, I was talking to a group on um, Friday and I'm like, there's there's money out there too. So also don't feel like you all have to take all this on by yourself. And also just remember that oftentimes there are like resources to really push a lot of these conversations forward. So, I mean, definitely something I'd love to keep on talking about and I welcome any other questions and if you want to send me an email, but I'll get you some resources from the ones I, I shared so far. I'm excited to hear you all thinking about it though. I see a hand. Uh, if you have a question, you can feel free to ask us. So. Uh, I have a question, you know, the last question was mine. Okay. Do you hear me? Yep, I hear you. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for your presentation. You know, as far as I see, the children spend most of their time at school. Yes. So I asked this question because they have their classes, after school activities, mm -hmm. and most of their time uh, they spend at schools and yeah. unfortunately there are some cases happening and uh, we are just receiving mails you know we are sorry to hear that we are sad uh, but as far as i see i don't see any solutions mm. uh, and uh, as you are the michigan department of health and human services mm -hmm. Uh, don't you have any impact plans mm -hmm. about the school districts, for example, mm -hmm. like a professional like you? Mm -hmm. uh, there might be some employers working at schools, you know? Yeah. Uh, because the schools, you know, there are 3,000 uh, students at one school. Yes. Uh, they need these professionals like you. And um, and after the feedbacks, I, I know that, you know, now you are giving some presentations and you are getting some feedbacks. And Department of Michigan has to have some solutions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I wonder if Department of Health and Human Services have any impact on the school districts, yeah. on the government that, for example, one of the issues I see, uh, the school system is different uh, in the United States than when you compare with other uh, countries, especially mm -hmm. Europe. Uh, for example, the breaks, the, you know, the breaks in uh, classes it's only five minutes you know the lunches you know uh, is too short you know those students do not have time to interact with each other or spend time with uh, each other 
sometimes the most of the time, uh, you know, uh, the the time that they spend together is at their school buses. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, that was only one example. So I am just wondering, uh, Michigan Department of Health and Human Services might have some impact to the school districts yeah. and some solutions uh, for the staff and also for the students. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you so much for sharing all of that. I, I just, I really, I hear the intention that you're sharing that. And I also appreciate the examples that you had given because I'm, I'm also in a place to, to advocate for things often and don't always know, um, exactly what those suggestions might look like. I just, I appreciated the the imagery of even just having more time to interact with one another and just how quickly that passing time is. You know, I think we don't, we just don't think about that enough. And I appreciate the opportunity to think about that for a second. Um, and definitely something I'll take back to other conversations. It, it's hard for me to speak on this formally, <laughs> but <laughs> um, I, I just, I want you to hear a hundred percent. Yes. And what I'll, I'll be a hundred percent transparent as honest as I can. The department, the um, MDHHS does still have the component where we're connected to the department of education, right? The Michigan department of education. Yeah. So Michigan Department of Education has health systems that are connected to different school districts. And there are tons of different initiatives in funding. And the other program that I'm talking about is connected to the Michigan Department um, of Education and is ingrained into these schools. So the idea is that it's happening, right? The the rollout of it happening is in progress. I think we're wanting to see so much more um, of the result, right? The impact of that. We want to see it quicker. I'm with you. It, it Because we know what the need is, it's never going to feel quick enough. But I do want you to hear that those conversations are happening and that there is funding that is supporting mental health in schools. And I can also tell you that right now, that's also just even being evaluated to see where do we go from here? Is this really working? Where does this money need to go? What kind of programs need to exist? Um, there's training and free training again that's that's happening for admin and school mental health professionals and you know so there's there's a lot happening and I really want to acknowledge that and I think on the other end I, I hope that it's helpful to you to hear at least a, a glimmer of <laughs> yes I, I know sometimes with the state everything isn't terribly transparent in terms of what we get to see um, that's happening behind the screens and all those pieces are moving so um, hopefully we keep on moving in that direction and I think what we can do is keep on advocating for what we want to see in our schools on a local level, on a county level, and on a statewide level um, and keep on making sure that we're getting that funding into schools to support mental health because that's that's not always the easiest to do either. So we need we need folks like yourself that continue to advocate and say that out loud and make sure it's at the forefront. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you so much, Ms. Corhonen, for coming out and talking to us about this. It's been such a great uh, experience for all of us here. Um, as we are ending with like coming close to our time here, I just want to make a closing statement uh, saying thank you once again. I hope everyone was able to gain something from this. That was something that the high school chapter was hoping to reach out and do since we know that it's been very rough with like the past few years with COVID and everything seeing like a trend uh, with whether it's depression or anxiety or it's just struggling overall with whatever it may be. We want to give resources out to people like Ms. Corhonen uh, said with like the links she can provide and like programs or support groups if you want to call it. Uh, it's 
always um, all right to be reaching out to someone. Yes. So that's something we want to reiterate here in the high school chapter. So thank you once again. I hope everyone was um, as happy as me to have her with us. Is there anything else you want to add? add to the closing statement I would just like to say thank you again thank you so much for having me for allowing me this space to be here with you all um I think the other thing I wanted to mention about reaching out for support I I want to echo that and not stop echoing that it's always okay to reach out for support I need that counseling line I always like to say you don't have to share any more information than you're comfortable sharing so don't hesitate to make the call. You can decide after you make the call what you want to share, but sometimes that first step is the hardest. I know it's it's anxiety provoking sometimes, right? It can be really scary. Um, so for many reasons, it's okay to reach out and just decide when you, you know, when you make that call, what you wanna you wanna share. Um And then again, I'll share out the resources, but please check out the website, share information about the discussion groups, the workshops, please attend if you feel like it would be helpful. I would love to see you all. Um, And then just please don't hesitate to reach out to me if I can be of support in any way, or there's any questions that come up after this, but thank you again so much. All righty. Thank you. Um, 